Hi, we are back with Evangeline, the tale of a Katie, and we are ready for section three. And um, if you remember in the last section, the notary had just gotten to the house and um, he's an interesting character. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I can um, play his part effectively for you while we read it. Be sure and follow along and um, pay attention to the descriptions, but also um, to the stories and the discussions that are going on. All right, so this is section three from part the first of Evangeline. Bent like a laboring oar that toils in the surf of the ocean, bent but not broken by age, was the form of the notary public. Shocks of yellow hair, like the silken floss of the maize, hung over his shoulders. His forehead was high, and glasses with horn bows set astride on his nose with a look of wisdom supernal. Father of twenty children was he, and more than a hundred children's children rode on his knee and heard his great watch tick. Four long years in the times of war had he languished a captive, suffering much in an old French fort as the friend of the English. Now, though warrior grown, without all guile or suspicion, ripe in wisdom was he, but patient and simple and childlike. He was beloved by all, and most of all by the children, for he told them tales of the loup garou in the forest, and of the goblin that came in the night to water the horses, and of the white Latiche, the ghost child who unchristened died, and was doomed to haunt unseen the chambers of children, and how on Christmas Eve the oxen talked in the stable, and how the fever was cured by a spider shut up in a nutshell, and of the marvelous powers of four-leaf clover and horseshoes, with whatsoever else was writ in the lore of the village. Then up rose from his seat the, by the fireside Basil the blacksmith, knocked from his pipe the ashes, and, slowly extending his right hand, Father LeBlanc, he exclaimed, thou hast heard the talk in the village and perchance canst tell us of some news of these ships and their errand. Then, with modest demeanor, made answer the notary public, Gossip enough have I heard in sooth, yet am never the wiser, and what their errand may be I know not better than others, yet am I not of those who imagine some evil intention brings them here, for we are at peace, and why then molest us? God's name, shouted the hasty and somewhat irascible blacksmith. Must we in all things look for the how and the why and the wherefore? Daily justice is, injustice is done, and might is the right of the strongest. But without heeding his warmth, continued the notary public, man is unjust, but God is just, and finally justice triumphs. And well, I remember a story that often consoled me when as a captive I lay in the old French fort at Port Royal. This was the old man's favorite tale, and he loved to repeat it when his neighbors complained that any injustice was done to them. Once in an ancient city, whose name I no longer remember, raised aloft on a column, a brazen statue of justice stood in the public square, upholding the scales in its left hand, and in its right hand sword, as an emblem that justice presided over the laws of the land, and the hearts and homes of the people. Even the birds had built their nests in the scales of the balance, having no fear of the sword that flashed in the sunshine above them. But in the course of time, the laws of the land were corrupted. Might took the place of right, and the weak were oppressed, and the mighty ruled with an iron rod. Then it chanced in a nobleman's palace that a necklace of pearls was lost. And ere long, suspicion fell on an orphan girl who lived as a maid in the household. She, after form of trial, condemned to die on the scaffold, 
patiently met her doom at the foot of the statue of justice. As to her father in heaven, her innocent spirit ascended low, or the temp city a tempest rose, and the bolts of the thunder smote the statue of bronze and hurled in wrath from its left hand down on the pavement below the clattering scales of the balance, and in the hollow thereof was found in the nest of a magpie, into whose clay-built walls the necklace of pearls was interwoven. Silenced, but not convinced, when the story was ended, the blacksmith stood like a man who fain would speak, but findeth no language. All his thoughts were congealed into lines on his face as the vapors freeze in fantastic shapes on the window panes in winter. Then Evangeline lighted the brazen lamp on the table, filled till it overflowed the pewter tanker with home brown brewed nut brown ale that was famed for its strength in the village of Grand Pre, while from his pocket the notary drew his papers and inkhorn and wrote with a steady hand the date and the age of the parties, naming the dower of the bride in flocks of sheep and cattle. Orderly, all things proceeded, and duly and well were completed, and the great seal of law was set like a sun on the margin. Then, from his leathern pouch, the farmer threw on the table three times the old man's fee in solid pieces of silver, and the notary, rising and blessing the bride and bridegroom, lifted aloft the tankard of ale and drank to their welfare, wiping the foam from his lip, he solemnly bowed and departed, while in silence the others sat and mused by the fireside till Evangeline brought the draught board out of its corner. Soon was the game begun. In friendly contention, the old men laughed at each lucky hit or unsuccessful maneuver, laughed when a man was crowned or a breach was made in the king row. Meanwhile, apart, in twilight gloom of a window's embrasure, sat the lovers and whispered together, beholding the moon rise over the pallid sea and the silvery mist of the meadows, silently one by one, in the infinite meadows of heaven blossomed the lovely stars, the forget-me-nots of the angels. Thus was the evening past. Anon the bell from the belfry rang out the hour of nine, the village curfew, and straightway rose the guests and departed, and silence reigned in the household. Many a farewell word and sweet good night on the doorstep lingered long in Evangeline's heart, Evangeline's heart and filled it with gladness. Carefully then were covered the embers that glowed on the hearthstone, and on the oaken stairs resounded the tread of the farmer. Soon, with a soundless step, the foot of Evangeline followed. Up the staircase moved a luminous space in the darkness, lighted less by the lamp than the shining face of the maiden. Silent, she passed the hall and entered the door of her chamber. Simple that chamber was, with its curtains of white and its clothes press ample and high, on whose spacious shelves were carefully folded linen and woolen stuffs by the hand of Evangeline woven. This was the precious dower she would bring to her husband in marriage. Better than flocks and herds, being proofs of her skill as a housewife. Soon she extinguished her lamp, lamp for the mellow and radiant moonlight, streamed through the windows and lighted the room till the heart of the maiden swelled and obeyed its power like the tremulous tides of the ocean. Oh, she was fair, exceeding fair to behold as she stood with naked snow-white feet on the gleaming floor of her chamber, Little she dreamed that below, among the trees of the orchard, waited her lover, and watched for the gleam of her lamp and her shadow. Yet were her thoughts of him, and at times a feeling of sadness passed o'er her soul, as the sailing shade of clouds in the moonlight flitted across the floor and darkened the room for a moment. And as she gazed from the window, she saw serenely the moon pass forth from the folds of a cloud, and one star follow her footsteps 
as out of Abraham's tent young Ishmael wandered with Hagar. Well, there's several Bible references in that passage. Did you pick up on them? Especially there at the end. Also, there's a discussion about the draught board. And there and it talks about the movement of the pieces on the game board. And I don't know about you, but I think it sounds an awful lot like checkers. What do you think? Anyway, that was the end of section three. We'll come back next time for section four. So stay tuned. And if you're taking a Becca ninth grade, good luck on that quiz. Pay attention.